Hello and good evening for us and uh, good morning or good afternoon if uh, that is where you're at. Um, welcome to Keystroke International, uh, a destination for readers, writers, either or both. Um, I'm Ralph Kern and I'm here with my uh, good buddy, uh, John Evans. Uh, and uh, today um, we're going to discuss a, a couple of things. Um, firstly is a, an event that I went to um, called Point of Science. Um, which was a um, which is put on by our local university, Birmingham University, where we had an astronaut come to visit, Tony Antonelli. Uh, so it was a really cool, well, for me, yeah, cool uh, question and answer session uh, where we had the astronaut there and uh, we, we were discussing things about his career. And then for the um, second half of our show, um, we're going to discuss. Um, ship types in military science fiction uh, something which is um uh, you know can add immeasurably to your world building um but also is something that people sometimes um uh, go their own way on and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but also there's there's a lot of history there as well which people might want to consider or perhaps use um in their own work so uh, firstly uh, should we should we Start off with you, though, John. Um, what what have you been up to uh, over the last uh, since the last show? Um, well, I've been um, working on the world building for a for a shared universe that we'll be doing with um, Keystroke Medium, and we'll be um, probably by the time this is broadcast in a couple of weeks, we'll we'll have announced a bit more about that. Um, but essentially, it's a uh, it's it's a universe about. Um, law enforcement officers and and their adventures. So it's um, it's it's not the usual grand stories of military science fiction and so on. It's 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 more um, character focused stories about their uh, about about various types of law enforcement professionals trying to uh, you know solve crimes and 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 deal with everything from from um, from uh, local murder mysteries to you know big big dangerous uh, criminal organizations and so on so uh, there'll be plenty of scope for people to tell great stories there um, and it's a it's hopefully going to be a really exciting project and we're, we're getting to the point where um, it's it's ready for other people to look at, at what we've built um, so Josh will be um, Josh will be dealing with that end of things um, so yeah, so that's really exciting, and it's and it's one of the many tasks that I have on my uh, on my whiteboard. That I want to be able to tick off. You know, I've got got to the point where I can I can pause on that, and the next thing I have to do is answer somebody's questions about the <laughs> about the world rather than generate things, which would be uh, which would be nice. So it's a really exciting project, and for those who um, might not know key, Keystroke Medium. Uh, it, it, yeah, essentially, it was formed by um, a couple of cops from um, uh, Kansas um, who were also authors of um, uh, military science fiction, fiction especially. Um, and then uh, they, 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 they got me involved very, very graciously, and uh, it's kind of ex expanded from there. So our, our core is, uh, oh, I'll say the core, um, uh, you, you know, the starting place of uh, was was. Um, it was cops and then before we expanded massively and uh, most welcomely to uh, encounter other people so it's a really exciting project that's uh, close to our close to our hearts or close to the uh, close to what 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 forms forms uh, us really so uh, it'll be great yeah. well i mean that, that that was the reason for for suggesting it as a universe because um it, the reason i'm i'm doing the the, the basic world building um uh, is is because I'm the muggins that stood up and said, well, "Why don't you do it based on law enforcement? Because you've got so many, you know, uh, a, a, a lot of the um, sci-fi authors out there have a military background, but in this case, you've got a group of sci-fi authors where there are at least four involved with Keystone Medium who have um, who have law enforcement backgrounds, um, and, um, and Josh has been in the military as well. But um, yeah, and it's a it's a it's a great it's a great area for stories, um, and it's an area where there's a lot of history um, of, of sci-fi um, based on based on crime solving and so on. So um, I'm not going to go into that in, in, in detail now, but if you're watching this show, 
spend a couple of minutes and you'll probably be able to think of quite a few um, people from Robocop to Judge Dredd to all sorts of um, all sorts of others that are uh, that are basically about cops catching bad guys as opposed to you know warriors defeating space navies and mm -hmm. uh, hopefully hopefully it'll be interesting maybe we'll even help create a new genre on uh, on amazon or something like yeah, that my, yeah it might it might might lead to a bit of a resurgence you know um so uh yeah yeah oh, okay awesome um so my my week um pretty much still been uh, been ticking away on my projects um uh I've got nothing really new new to add to that other than I'll be getting edits on my second book in that series that I'm releasing, The Great War, um, back at some point this week, um, which is nice. It's going to be nice. It, I was like looking at my Write Club, uh, which is an app I use, and it's nice to have like three books written and sort of just waiting for stuff to, to come back on it. And then uh, I've, I've managed to get stuck into my fourth book um, as well in that series, um, which is which is great. And... Uh, one of our one of our friends, a um, a cover designer and really excellent artist, Jamie, has um, has been doing some amazing work on the fourth book. Um, so it's um, so the like the Great War, like covers the Second World War, and like the first one is Dunkirk, the uh, like in in a military science fiction translated event. So. Uh, rather than Dunkirk, it's sort of like there's uh, the army trapped on a planet, and then the second one is um, like against the um, uh, against the uh, the future equivalent of the Bismarck. The third one is like a convoy caught in the situation where they've got to get to A to B, and they're, they're being attacked heavily. But the fourth one is like where they where they turn to um, where where the bad guys, the Nazis or the Neos, as they're called in this universe, have turned to um, um, uh, like attack um, uh, the people. Uh, which are which are essentially the Russian. This a Russian front. Um, Jamie, anyway, he's uh, he's gone. Do you want a character for that? I'm I'm I'm, I'm figuring out this new character generation process for my art. And uh, do you want me on that? And uh, so he started building this this character. So uh, I, I kind of the basis I've used is like enemy at the gate. So it's like come as a sniper in on the Russian front, and he's he's created this like really good like um sniper um characters female sniper which is loosely based on a on a real real woman um from the uh, from the second world war and it's like wow that is like yeah you, know, you just look at it and think you've captured that character so wow uh and uh, you, you know we've got, got to find i'm going to do a lot of multimedia uh promotion stuff for it and um you, you know even though it won't be used in the cover it'll be like used as part of the uh, i don't the ad words or the trailers and stuff like that and uh that's you know it's like you've just captured her everything sort of like from her kind of like the you know, you know kind of like the world where it is but the fact she's young and all that kind of stuff it's like really really good but it's very different writing in that and uh you and i john we were having some discussions weren't we because uh because it's um you're writing from i'm writing from the point of view of um kind of a, a Russian soldier in the Second World War uh, for this story. And it's sort of like the fact that they were treated quite brutally by their own command. And uh, yeah. uh, you know, they don't know anything. They don't know anything about outside of their little theatre. So it's keeping the focus really tightly on them. But you've got world shattering events happening around them. That they don't know what's happening beyond kind of the sights of the weapon and things like that. And it's sort of like how to get that balance between sort of carrying the strategic and even tactical situation and also just what's happening to them so that, that's a real kind of fine balance along with all the propaganda that's hitting hitting her and it's yeah it's an interesting book it's it's a, it's a real challenge uh, yeah. to get right um yeah i mean I, I i would think that the russian soldiers in uh, in in stalingrad places they they probably had more propaganda than they had actual information about about the job that they were trying to do absolutely um, so yeah. They, 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 they were they were treated pretty poorly <laughs> um and uh i i would imagine that at that time as well they they weren't particularly well educated um because you know, they've been it's, um but ultimately i mean it, it, again it's it's another fine balance because um you know in that circumstance it, it, it very much was the case of the enemy of my enemy is my friend rather than a natural yeah. ally and um you know the regime that they work for is absolutely deplorable uh, and there's no um, you know there's no sugarcoating it there was a brutal brutal regime um but still you know i don't 
while, whilst I want to show that, I want to also show as well there were there were heroes who who you know the the world uh, you, you know is is you know thankfully free of Nazis because of the actions and you know there's no doubt they had the Russians had a real harsh time in World War Two you know. It's, compared like I think we had 1.2 million casualties which is a horrendous amount but then you compare it to uh, how many the Russians had which was over 20 million and you're like whoa yeah, <laughs> yeah. a lot of that is that the fact that they were thrown into that absolute meat grinder of a, of a war yeah uh, yeah absolutely you know they were they were under equipped and um under under fed and they they really didn't stand a you know a, a chance of putting up the resistance that they that they could have had they been you know supported by a society that could work um but their, you know, yeah. their society no longer worked at that point um and, and hadn't for a, quite a long time so they just had they just threw millions and millions of bodies at the germans who um who, who cut them down like like they were fighting yeah. trench warfare it was um, it's a human thing. of course like starship troopers except you kind of write it from the perspective of the bugs and you've got to kind of you've got to personify that person and you've got to kind of yeah so yeah. like yeah, yeah in, in in the films what they're what they're doing militarily in, in, in the starship Kruger film it doesn't really make much sense because they, they they rock up with their little guns and they go bang bang and and the bugs don't drop dead <laughs> because <laughs> because it's not how he wrote you know so they've kind of got the bugs like they were in the books but they haven't been in the book but they haven't got the the power armor so <laughs> you know it's it, it's a completely different sort of style of warfare so yeah it, it, it is very much like the idiotic yeah, you know, uh, idiotic version of things like World War One trench warfare and, yeah. and and stuff, where you know they they were still doing things like we used to do when um, when we were fighting the Napoleonic Wars, where it was, hey, you if you want to get promoted, lead the charge into the breach, because mm. if you survive, which you probably won't, <laughs> you'll probably get a promotion. <laughs> you know? And the opportunity for heroes to arise is much more limited. Uh, yeah, and like and it's very like, hard to become a hero if you are immediately shot dead. Yeah, and, and the fact is they have more numbers as well. So yes. the Russians have yeah. more numbers than than the Germans. So you kind of got to. Yeah. It's a, it's a, like a kind of weird reverse scenario because quite often the scenario is you've got the you've got the good guys being the outnumbered ones, like uh, like kind of. Yes. Through, but it, and in this case, the Germans are kind of like advancing and against all like the, the massive odds. And you've got so my hero has got to be kind of you know one of both one of the mass, but also distinctive enough to to stand out and make that difference. So it, it's real challenges. It's a it's a real interesting um, book to write. I'm learning a hell of a lot more than I ever thought I'd learn about that 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 side of that side of yeah. the war. It, it yeah. is absolutely fascinating you realize just how much of a i've begun to realize how much of a important front it was versus the um versus sort of the uh, you know, our front and um uh, you know with the, the battle of britain and the battle of atlantic and uh, then on to d-day and so on and so forth um uh, the the american front which was you know joined us on d-day and the um, um and the and the pacific Pacific War, which is going to be the start of the next book, which I'm really looking forward to because uh, that's sort of like some really kind of exciting stuff. Um, but then it's a whole other side, which I think is poor, poorly understood. Um, and I don't mean that to sound patronising, but it's just that it doesn't really feature into our world history. But then you kind of look at sort of how crucial that was in the in the triumvirate of the resistance against the Nazis and. Uh, uh, so, so hopefully, uh, my my hope for this is to perhaps bring a, you know do my small part in bringing a little bit of awareness. And even though, uh, and to be absolutely clear, uh, the the overarching regime was pretty wasn't it became the bad guys in the in the yeah. 50s onwards, didn't they? But yeah, um, they they were um, they were equally as bad as the um, as uh, the, the, yeah. the, the the Nazis by you know the, by any same measure yeah. um but um the nazis actually make better villains though yeah, and, yeah. unless you uh, unless we're talking spies have you ever watched um uh they're like the simpsons and uh there's I can't, I can't remember his name uh but they've basically got an arnold schwarzenegger kind of character yeah um, he's in a like he's a movie star and he's always fighting against the, the commune nazis yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and they've got the swastika with the hammer and sickle. <laughs> nice. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, those two sides really, really hated each other. So, but anyway, um, yeah. right. So on, on to sort of today. Um, so, so yeah, how did that? How, so t- tell us about the event then. What what was what was the event and where was it and. Okay. Well, what what it is is um, the universities in here in the UK run an event called or, or run a series of events called Point of Science, and the idea is is that they get um, exciting guest lecturers in from um, uh, from various fields, and then um, they'll deliver a presentation on it. So the presentation that we had, or the one that me and my my, my girlfriend so, went. One point of order. Where does the point come in? Ah, I'll get to that. I'll get oh, to that. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah, for those who know me, there has to be alcohol involved somewhere along the line. Um, they uh, so um, oh, I'll, I'll cover that now. So as part of the point of science, what they do is what, when they host an event in one of these uh, in a university, they'll go and find a local brewery, and um, so uh, that in this this case, I can't remember. I can't remember what the brewery is. Really nice. Um, beer that they uh, a botanical beer uh, which is sort of like almost like a fruity beer which i thought that sounds horrible but <laughs> I really want to see this astronaut uh, who's at the point of science so i'll go to it and i was like this, this is really nice and even even my girlfriend who's not a beer drinker was like oh, yeah, i like this <laughs> it's yeah. like a, it's like a beer stroke gin and tonic anyway uh, dwelling far too much on that um so yeah it's, it's held in a hall and um they'll, they'll, they'll get these guest speakers in, and in this case it was um at birmingham university my local um, university it was a, an astronaut called tony antonelli um who's a um who's a u.s navy veteran as well um he's a um he held the rank of commander uh, and through his naval uh, sorry his nasa career um you 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 retain your rank um he is retired now he works for lockheed martin but he's a uh, he was a naval commander flying f-18s um off the uh, off the nimitz primarily but he's also a test pilot uh, as well so um you know so many fascinating questions to ask him about that side even just that side of his life but you know he was here about the nasa side of his life so um i'm gonna to have to get just just refer to the sort of history for the timings uh but in um 2000 um 2000 he um he, he applied for and joined nasa and he, he he um he got on first time which is apparently very rare um but just, for like someone to apply and, and succeed in that in, in the astronaut application process first time um that being said he he, he had to wait for um for nine years to get his flight first flight which was um sts um 19 119 uh, 119 um which was um so his first so he's flown two missions so the first was uh, delivering a pair of um, solar arrays and the truss arrays to the to the space station um so the solar arrays obviously how how the space station generates its power the truss when you have a look at pictures of the space station you see that quite a lot of it looks like um crane girders for want of a better phrase um, and that that's what the the modules and the, the various components of the space station hang off that is absolutely vital um to 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 have those because they form the inherent structure of the <laughs> of the space station and then um uh, and then just over a year later he flew he flew a, a second mission uh, as well uh, uh, where um they delivered a russian um uh, science module to to the station and and dock that um dot that to it so increase the, the the space station's capabilities but his role was actually as the um space shuttle pilot um wow. which is you know is as he openly admitted and one thing to say about this guy he was uh, you know obviously he's had a massively inspirational career you know i was just i, I was basically like tell me more anthony tell me. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, you know, I was, I was just sat there like absolutely starstruck. Um, but he was also really witty, weird, really self-deprecating, really humble. But also, he, he could have a really valid career as a stand-up comedian because he was just so, <laughs> so like witty with everything he was saying. Um, 
but uh, yeah so he was saying like he was like going yeah space shuttle pilot you know that's like the coolest the coolest job title ever and uh, yeah. and it's like even how he referred to it so for the for any of our military viewers they'll often know that there's like little military inside jokes that kind of um you know other other veterans of the military or or, or for myself and uh, for, for, for other members of the, the keystroke community they know that like, as police we have like little inside jokes that we will say and like the others will like have a wry smile on the face so like when he was saying like yeah the first time i was launched uh, it's the best my first launch was uh, 2009 that was that, that was the first time i got voted off the planet <laughs> 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 like that you know like how they, how they kind of viewed it and you can tell that's sort of like something yeah. something that's really inherent within the astronaut community um and i find that really um you know really interesting because it's a it's a little snippet of a culture that you can only ever see from the outside and yeah. you and i um the you know the overwhelmingly vast majority of people will never sort of would we, we'll never sort of be part of that but like little things like that just like a little hint of you know the kind of conversation that goes on in the in the sort of like you know in the bar uh, yeah or, uh, yeah that's a that room that's a lovely little lovely little touch there's a bit in um in the martian where where they say that so and so is a, a steely-eyed missile missile man yeah and, and that's actually a phrase that they they, that they do use at, at nasa and it stems from one of the um, it, it stems from one of the, the sort of I don't know the, the the golden age of of you know actually landing on the moon when we did things that that are no more impressive than that, than what they're doing now. It's just that it looks more impressive sending people to the moon than, mm. than, than 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 what they do now. But actually, technologically speaking, it it isn't. Um, yeah. But, unless, um, unless we forget that um, the yeah. the original Redstone rockets that um, the Mercury. My, uh, the Mercury and Gemini um, spacecraft were mounted on were literally missiles. They were yes. intercontinental ballistic missiles that had been, yeah. been yeah. replicated into being um, into being uh, um, the launches for human spacecraft. Uh, so that, that that was where the terms I think it first came in with Alan Shepard, you know, you're yeah. a really eyed missile man, and but uh, and again, it's just sort of like a little hint of the culture that, that goes in a really special culture. Um, well, I tell you that 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 Sawyer's capsule they had in the in the museum here because uh, they had Tim Peake's Sawyer's capsule there for a, for a couple of months. Um, when you looked at it, it did not look like something that could ever have been space worthy. Um, there was a panel on on one side of it that's that's exposed and it's got like electrical out what look like electrical outlets on its plug sockets and there's like about 20 different types of of socket on there so i'm guessing it's to plug in some kind of diagnostics or whatever but the rest of the outside of the of the the you know the um conical capsule which is not big by the way you've got to get fit fit three people in there and it's it's only a few meters across so it's you know, when you look through the window, it's, it's kind of tiny on the inside, um, like the size of garden shed, maybe. Yeah, if that. But, but but without, you know, but conical at the top, so there really isn't lots of luxurious space in there for them to come down in these things. But the outside of the thing is burnt. It looks burnt and battered and damaged, and and it also looks like something that's out of a low rent steampunk thing. Yeah. Not, not cool steampunk, like like Blue Peter version of steampunk and for the americans in the audience, blue peter is a children's show where they continually make you know they make stuff that eight-year-olds make out of toilet rolls and and bottles at school you know in arts and crafts or whatever you know it, it, it looks like that it, it, it does not look like something that that you should you know it looks like something you might see in flash gordon in 1930s you know in in, in the in the earliest films you know it does not look like a nice sleek cool it doesn't look like the space shuttle which is you know which looked quite space worthy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um yeah but i mean i i to be fair i i don't know what they look like before they drop them through the atmosphere perhaps they look better 
uh, uh, until the point they drop them back through the atmosphere and then maybe all the cladding's burnt off or whatever. I, I have no idea, but you would, you would um, hope so. You would hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, they work. So, uh, but but we're not we're not, we're not overspending on luxury to send these guys up there. Yeah. Well, or as uh, as, as I've been reliably informed, uh, Sayez is oh, right. okay. uh, pronunciation is you know it's it's an absolute workhorse. It's been doing the uh, doing the job for years, but yeah. um, obviously. Um, uh, Mr. Antonelli, uh, Commander Antonelli, it was um, uh, his 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 thing was the was the space shuttle. Um, so a lot of it was um, as a bit of a science fiction geek and a hard science fiction geek. Um, with <laughs> how, to, how to not sound arrogant? It was like a little bit kind of you know it, it, it was it was his, a lot of his talk was for sort of like mass audience and not people yeah. with like mass you know a huge amount of knowledge. It was sort of like I don't know anything about space and I'll still get something from it. So um, so it was really well pitched, uh, really engaging. Um, uh, but just on the note of sort of like the hardware, um, it, it one of the questions was you know what kind of training did 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 you did you go through? And uh, it, it was like, well, a lot of our training took place on a um, on a business jet, and he didn't say the type. Um, you know, the geek in me was like, tell, tell me the type. You know, was it Learjet, Gulfstream? What? Yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> I want to hear this stuff. Uh, but yeah, as, as I say, yeah, this is this is where it's pitched. And uh, what they what they do is um, <laughs> it's like a really low tech method of training, almost. So um, like the um, the left hand seat where the where the um, where he was being trained on um, was um, uh, which, which um, uh, for anyone who's done any flying that that's where you, you first start to learn to fly is on the left hand seat and um, he's saying like right we're flying this 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 business jet type thing that's been modified and uh, right so the first thing we have to do is get these pieces of cardboard out and we put the cardboard around the um, around the uh, my 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 half of the the aircraft to to sort of reduce my visibility to what i would see in the shuttle so the because the it's got quite big windows but they're quite far away from where the where the pilot sits whereas in the, that, that that particular type of aircraft you're quite close to, so you have to reduce the the visibility it says then we've got to make it fly like a um uh, like a uh, a space shuttle so what we do is we take it up to thirty thousand feet and then um the first thing we do is um, we've got a special mode in it where we drop we can drop the landing gear or, or uh, the two rear landing gear to, to to give us a load of extra drag because um, to start it sort of like performing the, the aircraft performing like a space shuttle does. Yeah, like a flying brick, basically. Yeah. That's not enough. Uh, so what they do is then they, um, they then they activate the thrust reversers on the aircraft, so they throttle it all the way back, uh, but not just like to the to the natural stop where the engines are dead they activate the thrust reverses where they pull it back even further and that opens up the um, for the only one who's i don't presume most people have who've, who've landed in a in a passenger aircraft as you hit the hit the ground you're rolling along you'll hear the engine suddenly rise in volume and that's because they hit the thrust reverses which is where you'll see or if, if you're looking outside uh, out the back the um like these um a cone will close over the rear of the um of the exhausts, which will then vent the exhaust like, like that, that way uh, in front, which will slow him down even further. And he's like, now that flies like a space shuttle. <laughs> which makes it sound like an absolute dog to, yeah. to fly. And he uh, said, so then we've got to land, land the thing. Um, and um, well, so yeah. he was coming into land and he's like absolutely focused. And he says, and then he made the mistake of looking over at the instructor's side, uh, which is just like, set up as normal and it says like the controls are bouncing around all over the place and like the whole thing is uh, like juddering and shaking and he's like i'm glad i'm focused on this side because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that side looks terrifying and, and yeah it's a bit of an unsung hero because you know yeah for these instructors they're having to teach the shuttle pilots how to land this aircraft that's an absolute dog they've got to give have the confidence in the pilots and let's let's be fair the pilots are absolutely massively experienced and uh, like mo most of the shuttle pilots and commanders are test pilots and things like that so they're well used to sort of like flying in really what we'd call adverse conditions but um but still you know to be you, you've got to be a real cool customer say right okay this guy's practicing his first space shuttle landing on this 
on this thing we, yeah we've done all the run-up and this is going to happen and you know we've made the the aircraft as unairworthy as we can because a space shuttle is just a brick with wings and uh, it's like so he's like ah oh, glad glad i don't have to instruct um so yeah it, and as i say um, I'm, I'm really poorly portraying it because he's really wittily yeah it, this is the kind of thing you, it, it was there was probably about 200 people sat in this this theater and it was like he was such an engaging guy. It was like you were sat at a bar with him, sharing a beer, and he was like telling these stories, and he was, and he was like making everyone laugh and chuckle as he was going. Um, I was just thinking like the the other one things that I found sort of like quite interesting that he was saying, um, and one of them was um, um, that um, like when, 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 once once the pilots go up to go up to the space station they've got like a the little uh, sorry once the shuttle crew go up to the space station got like a, a little bit of flexibility about where where they sleep and where's comfortable for them to sleep uh, so a lot of them will just decamp from the space shuttle and go set up shop in this, in this space station where there's a little bit more space and um and he says yeah he, he, he has this like like little little area of sleep but anyway um as part of the his missions they were doing a few space walks to set up the solar rays and then the the russian module and uh, he says uh, that, that um when people were when people were going out on the space walk, the thing that no one had told him no one had no one had bothered to warn him about this was that when people go on the space walks because they're essentially in a tin can and then like they've got loads of tools and the space suits are quite hard and they're jangling against the the the, the space station modules and things like that it just sounds it, it sounds like someone's beating a drum when they're when they're making their way across the especially he says it just sounded so like kind of ropey and like kind of like they're going to come through they're going to come through the wall any they're going to come through the bulkhead any second now and it's like really it, it made it sound so disconcerting and uh, it's like that, that don't don't strike me as good uh, but that was on part of the question on um uh, the sounds of space which i, I never thought i would have found that an interesting subject but the the the, the other Thing that I, the game made me chuckle was that um, they take up loads and loads of these little egg time uh, like digital egg timers so you know just those tiny things you sort of like set a stopwatch or a timer going on them uh, and that's it um, because they've got like so many like experiments and things to do procedures to take place and and whatnot and um, uh, so they'll set loads of these little timers going and um, and then they'll write on a little bit of tape what the time is for and then just sort of like cast it adrift and then once once the uh, once the time had like bleeped down then uh, then um y you know they'll, they'll go find it right okay oh we've got to do this now and we've got to do that now he said loads of times the tape comes off them so they'll hear it like beep 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 beep, beep. like they'll like, yeah w w where is this and they'll like wade through a like swarm of these like timers and they'll find the one that's going on they'll look over and like the, the sticky tapes come off it and they're like well we, we know we've got to do something either an experiment or a vital process that might save our lives but we don't know what <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was that was um that was absolutely uh, you, you know it's just again it's those little little touches which i i found absolutely you know it's sort of fascinating about the reality of of their lives yeah, I mean, you, you you expect it to all be the ultra high tech stuff, but when you see the videos they shoot on the International Space Station and they show the laptop, you'll be like, that laptop casing looks really thick, and it, it's just old, isn't it? It's just an old chunky no, laptop. It's not like I chucked out ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 and, and, and you know, they're they're probably quite rugged ones, and maybe they've got some specialist components for for space, but I. I, I you know, a lot of the stuff they take up there is surprisingly, you know, surprisingly mundane. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's 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 quite fun. And when you when you think about how we actually portray science fiction in in most um, um, in most books and and TV shows and so on, a lot of it is overdone for no particular reason, like the. Um, like the bridge of the enterprise looks like it's been you know the, the the current sort of ones they look like they've been designed by some fashion designer or, or, or something there's no but not not really a spare a thought for any practicality whatsoever i always used to find 
the next generation really offensive because the um, they show the computer consoles and in the future we we don't use mice and we don't use keyboards we use random looking icons that don't have any text on them on them to tell you what the button does and illogical buttons and stuff and you're like that's that's not how we're going to compute in the future we're going to compute in exactly the same way we do now end of story there isn't a you know there's going to be practical buttons and we will put labels on them like adults <laughs> okay. yeah. well would there or wouldn't there and i think that might be a good good You've got the controls on the ship. You're not going to like have a have a have a console with a thousand buttons on it, and then go. None of them actually have any lettering on them. You know, yeah. it, it, it always cracks me up where they're like, "Oh yeah," and I'm I'm on the. But when they're on the alien ships, they're like, "Oh, that's okay. I don't speak this language, but I figured it out." How? That's <laughs> literally impossible. The little tri tricorder thing that they wave. Over. Yeah, but what you might have is fairly standard indicators for go and stop and oh my god seal the vault heads quickly yeah. <laughs> and on the enterprise they never have any engineering equipment around either you're like oh look somebody's chucked a hole through the side of the ship but i don't have emergency patch panels on the expanse there's an episode where something whipped through the ship and they immediately get out of their seats grab an emergency panel from the room that they're in and slap it over and they slap it over and it seals and then they weld it in place with the with the kit that's available in every room <laughs> and you're like oh yeah that makes kind of a lot of sense <laughs> you know? yeah. um, why would you not have that on a warship <laughs> you know? when you when you consider yeah you, know, you put, you put the equation you know on, on kind of a, a, a spacecraft uh, and again this might be um, worthy of its own own sort of show and discussion um, but you know like in every sort of area now in in a workplace you'll find that there's fire extinguishers and uh, uh, yeah. fire, perhaps fire sheets and uh, even uh, in certain areas what we call AEDs which are the um, um, machines to restart hearts and stuff like that and uh, and you know you're thinking well, well you know if we expand that you know some people say health and safety is a dirty word or dirty phrase but um, you know perhaps it'd be a good idea to have like these patches you can put over a, <laughs> over a old ship or yeah or something like that. Exactly. And that would be one of the most important, you know, there wouldn't be anybody on the ship who was allowed to live on on a ship like that, who didn't know how to use one of those, because that would be part of your basic, like, like, uh, when they've got uh, in, in, in navies, they do the helicopter crash training, and how to get out of the helicopter when it's underwater. You know, nobody gets out of that, you, you know, they, they all do stuff like that. Um, yeah, no one knows instantly yeah. how how you know no one no one's born yeah. with that ability but anyway yeah. we're probably digressing on stuff that um that deserves yeah. own show there um all right uh, so anyway the, the the summing up um firstly i'd i'd say if anyone has the um uh, um opportunity to go to an event like that please just go it's brilliant um especially like tony antonelli is really good good at that kind of thing i think he uh, he works for lockheed martin now um and when i did my homework on it um one of his projects is um uh essentially bootstrapping his way bootstrapping the way to mars so it's using ex existing technology or technology that will require minimal um development and sort of like saying can we put together a mars program with that which is a really fascinating thing in itself he, he, he didn't go into that in any depth whatsoever but yeah, that's his current project, and yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, think like, all right, okay, we, we need um, okay if we uh, if we decide to get the space station, we we kind of reconfigure it, add a couple of engines to it, which uh, which can be um, you know the solid boosters on the space shuttle or whatever or that we've got left over in a in a hangar somewhere, and uh, you, you know put it on a trans Mars injection trajectory, and uh, um, oh we, we we can like mock up a lander from uh, this that or the other. Um, although I think his project doesn't entail landing on Mars, it just is orbiting Mars. But anyway, by the by, it's kind of um, you know that's the kind of that's his project. So it's it, yeah. that's a real kind of MacGyver kind of stuff. Like this is what we've got and get us to Mars. And I love that kind of just that attitude that that these stuff. But anyway, um, really cool because you could you know if the space station isn't going to fall apart or fall out of space. Technically, you could shunt the whole thing into orbit around the moon or Mars or you know yeah. wherever, because it's just a matter of how long will it take to get there and will it will it hold together? Um, and would would you you know 
what what do you actually need for a Mars launch vehicle? I mean, I I, I like Elon, Elon Musk's plans for it. They're a fascinating look as to as how they will do it practically. But he's talking about colonizing it, not doing not doing a government funded. Let's send half a dozen people and and be pat ourselves on the back like we've done something. Yeah, you know. that's clearly yeah. that's kind of what 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 you know. He, he's clearly been given a brief like, all right, if you only have what we've got available today, get us to Mars. Yeah. And that that sounds yeah. like absolutely fascinating. Well, they've, in they, they, they've got a plan for contingencies as well because you know yeah. when when, yeah. when you go there, your 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 ideal plan is that they send ten rockets ahead and that they've all survived and that they are all, all the all the goods and supplies that you you get land, but in actual fact. They might get there and find that some of the stuff has been destroyed on impact and they and they didn't know yeah. um or or you know and, and presumably if you if you if you're sending 10 rockets of supplies uh, the the supplies will be spread out amongst the 10 rockets so that you know one being destroyed doesn't mm. destroy one vital you know like you don't lose all your air filters because that <laughs> but i think it's about a 60 percent success rate to get to mars isn't it at the moment so you, that will be your starting point you know like let's assume that yeah. Like 100 percent is 60 percent, and then we'd have to build our contingency on top of that as well. Yeah. So, you, you know, say you needed, you know, you needed like um, six six to actually land. You'd have to then add another 40 percent to that as well. Yes. So you'd need at least another two to to have yeah. the to have, to have a contingency. And then I think the 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 human rate it is sort of like you know an even higher standard. But anyway, um, let, yeah. let, let, let's move, move on to the next topic. Now the next topic is um, back to our sort of military um, science fiction roots. Um, one, of the, um, one of the most often used um, tropes, if well, not, not, not tropes, because that's tropes, is, that's a wrong term, it's a, that's a story, um, a story point, but um, one of the most often used things in um, military science fiction is um, space uh, um, warships, um, and it's a very easy thing to um, both get wrong and get right. Um, the first comment I'll say is that anyone who's a, who's an author in, um, in in military science fiction, they've absolutely got free reign to de define the the world that they um, they want. So well, what we're what we're talking about here is um, like what do what are the historical kind of warship types that um, that have been used through history and then sort of applying them to sort of like a fictional future space navy for want of a better phrase um now firstly like one of the best examples of where it's both gone wrong and got right so firstly i'll kind of negate the whole rest of the conversation if you if if, if you want to leave it here so take star wars for example um star wars has um has frigates has cruisers it has star destroyers and uh uh, and dreadnoughts and death stars and things like that now i would suggest to a naval or person with naval uh, current navy awareness it don't make a lick of sense uh, yeah no. so for example a destroyer is one of the smallest warship types that you can have a cruiser is bigger but they kind of got them reversed in the uh, in the um, in the show and uh, you know corvettes Pavilion, well, actually, Corvettes actually are quite close in uh, in in that show, um, and frigates and whatnot. They're all they all like play sort of slightly different roles, but actually, the these ship types have a quite a fixed place in um, in an existing or relatively recent naval hierarchy. Um, so when we were discussing the uh, the, the pre-show, it's kind of like we've got we've got to kind of um, we've kind of got to set a datum somewhere. And um, probably the, the there's a couple of couple of places we could have placed it, but um, the one that's most frequently used in military science fiction is uh, we, where it seems to work kind of relatively accurately is um, uh, at a kind of World War Two level, um, where you kind of have a set of ships which have a sort of like size, a rough size associated with them. Um, and then they perform certain functions within within the navy that's that's actually quite clearly defined. Um, whereas um, sort of some people just say you know you, you know bigger the better or uh, or you know we'll, we'll call our biggest ship a destroyer and our smaller ship a cruiser. And, you, know, you, you know actually that's kind of backwards and it's kind of um, so anyway. We'll, I'll, yeah. I'll do, do less justified and more more kind of 
like focusing back on uh, on what the real real world kind of examples are of um, where we're at. So as as we said, we, we, the the dead primary datum we're going to use is um, going to be World War Two um, because that's the most kind of varied that captures everything. We'll duck back into World War One a little bit, um, but also we'll we'll do like a little bit of a mention of um, the, the the age of sailing as well, which might be another alternative that's quite you, you, you know might get a wry grin in readers for for someone you you know someone in 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 the knowledge or someone willing hey. to do a quick Google. Uh, well, I, I actually, I, I, I can tell you how you can use that as well. I, I've got a friend who just um, uh, is putting a, a box set out of her, uh, four of her books, and uh, and it's Aetherpunk, which is like steampunk or dieselpunk or any of the other punks, but it's um, but it's steampunky type ships, but flying in the ether. Um, so it's as in space. So that would be ships of the line. That would be, you know but sealed and able to fly fly to mars and stuff um so yeah and, and that is that is absolutely science fiction so um pick, picking a picking a period of shipping um it, it makes a lot of sense and world war ii is a good example because what what the navies of the world are doing at the moment is completely different to what had to be done in world war ii um we don't we haven't had a an enormous uh, sort of naval engagement since World War Two, so the, the the ships are filling completely different roles, and I think I think the the, the military sci-fi um, space battles would be and and the navies would be more akin to World War Two than they would be to what we do now, which is um, deploy aircraft from the sea to attack land-based targets, um, have ships to defend those aircraft carriers, and then you deploy troops as well. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe not, you know, that, that's sort of like down to um, sort of like someone's individual world building, I guess, wouldn't it? So, um, and you know, that that's kind of like down, down to themselves. So, um, for example, um, in current era, um, like, uh, for example, we, we like the, the the warships uh, that one would traditionally think of warships um, from America to the UK to, to to Russia to China to to wherever you want to go they're, they're roughly like one size um, which is kind of like destroyer level uh, and then like for America uh, for us now thankfully after many years of development you know aircraft carriers um, but actually in terms of war fighting ability they're pretty much where, where it lies on your surface fleet. Of course, you've got submarines and ballistic missile submarines and, and whatnot, but they, they fill a slightly different function. Um, but if we're going to use sort of a blue... Okay, um, navies are roughly divided into blue and brown water. Um, so blue water is kind of... They can cross the seven seas, you know, if you, if you need that ship to go to... The opposite side of the world it has the capacity range and endurance to be able to do so a brown water is um it tends to be something that sort of like more operates around the coast so let, let's box them up let, let, let's get rid of the brown water very quickly um so because that's relatively easily addressable so that'd be things like your, your cutters uh so like your naval uh, your naval coast sorry your um, u.s coast guard ships that um uh, Guard the coast of the US. Um, uh, are for, for the UK, it'll be your patrol boats. Um, I think North Koreans have hundreds of these bloody things uh, because they're cheap, quick, and you know they don't have sort of like any particular um, well ability or need to sort of go much further. Than well, they can't. They, they, they flat out can't afford to build. Yeah, if they get it wrong. They want to. They want to. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't necessarily have that ability yet uh, yeah and thankfully so um but um so that's kind of like your brown water stuff so bang put in a box put over there um blue water are kind of like you you kind of things where as i say you you, you cross in the seven seas on these kind of things now um you, you've got a couple of the transition between the two so you've got like corvettes which are sort of like low endurance small warships that are um you know equally 
equally good. They've got a shallow draft. They can stay in, um, uh, stay close, tucked in close to the um, the coast, even go up rivers if need be. Um, but also they've got some kind of blue water ability. Uh, and they're, they're the really small patrol ships that, you know, they're not there to, to fight wars uh, or massive battles. They're there to sort of like, um, you know, just guard something that, you know, you, where you're not really expecting anything that's going to be able to, to fight against them. Um, and it's kind of like a, a very low level response, probably a policing function in, you know, anti-drug running, that kind of stuff. Um, that that'll be kind of your core bet. So they're relatively easily boxed off. But the the other four classes, uh, and this will be subdivided a little bit, which are more where we want to focus is. Um, so the smallest of like kind of the true blue waters um, is going to be your destroyers. Now um, destroyers traditionally, um, the, the, these terms are relatively. Um, relatively recently recent done but um they're defined as um a fast maneuverable long endurance warship which is intended to in escort large vessels in uh, fleet convoys or battle groups and defend them against smaller short range attackers um uh, they've also got subdivisions so you've got uh, they were kind of originally known as torpedo boat destroyers um so essentially our torpedoes attached to the side of them to, to 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 engage other torpedo boats and even as happened later they 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 were engaging sort of bigger ships um uh which <laughs> was uh, probably entailed a little bit of a kind of um a sort of like a fighter job mentality of like uh, you know holding the line against the bigger ones but ultimately the 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 relatively small small ships um, that um, are kind of the lowest tonnage of true blue water warships, uh, i.e. you can send them wherever you want want to send them. Um, now, in World War II, they tended to operate in squadrons and divisions, so they were very rarely on their own. Uh, they, would, they, would, they would form a flotilla of, um, uh, like a squadron, depending on the Navy, might be, might be up to like four, four, four ships, um, they'd have relatively small crews um, of, a, of a few hundred people, um, and um, it, it would be um, it would be billeted quite low in terms of rank. So, like a, to captain a destroyer, and we've discussed this on a previous show, might be as low rank relatively as a lieutenant commander or a lieutenant commander, um, and then a squadron commander might well be a commander or a captain. So, which, which I know sounds bizarre because you're kind of thinking, oh, we're we'll still talking multiple ships there. It, you know, it should be an admiral, but um, but ultimately in World War Two, that that's how they were they they were used. They were kind of um, they were either in peacetime, well, sorry, around World War Two in peacetime, they were sort of like sent to their own as sort of like little scouts and like kind of fast, maneuverable. They weren't really expected to fight a war on their own or a battle on their own. They were more kind of a trip wire for. Uh, for, 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 for other things. But then when the battle came, uh, and then you had your bigger ship, your cruisers, your battle battleships, your battleships um, they, were, they were there helping to protect against smaller threats, uh, but they weren't really expected to operate in the line of battle, which is something we'll go on to. Um, so that moves us on to cruisers. Now, uh, so cruisers are... Um, kind of mid-level warships and that's probably where you start to get something that you would traditionally think of as like kind of a, a true kind of world war ii era warship sort of like something quite big quite fast it has a it has um you know a great balance across all all spectrums so it's got you know it's got medium guns medium 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 armor medium speed um if you were playing it as Street Fighter 2 would be Ken or Ryu, if that makes sense. Who <laughs> 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 might have played arcade machines? As a kid. That is a weird analogy. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but it's true. Yeah, they don't excel at anything, but they're not particularly crap at anything either. They're, they're kind yeah. of like a nice little, the nice middle ground. And for me, anyway, if, if I was a captain of a ship, I would actually quite like to be a cruiser captain because. 
they're, they're small enough that they don't really have a place in the line of battle you know if, if it came to a big battle it's like then for reasons which I'll, I'll come on to when we come to, when we look at battleships um which would you know um yeah you don't have a place there you're kind of like sent out as a, in an independent independent command more than probably any of the other any any of the other things so yeah you've got like like kind of like a lot of diplomacy a lot of like long-range cruising you're projecting power um you basically you, you've got a government that's saying right we want a big warship going there to show that we're we're big but we can't afford to send well we don't want to send one of our big battleships because that's quite tightly locked into you, the line of you know one of our big battle squadrons um and we can't pull them away without degradate degradating the um um the uh the, the line of battle so um actually a lot of the most interesting engagements in in pretty much any war like up to where cruisers stopped being used was involved a cruiser yeah. uh, because you, you, you know you, they were cheap enough to send on their own but they were powerful enough to deal with a lot of stuff that came out came their way um so that's kind of cruiser level um and then we, we're kind of moving on to sort of like the big the big beasts then um so the next two big ships are battle cruisers and battleships um now firstly um in a lot of um a lot of media in a lot of books and things like that um they invariably say the battle cruiser is smaller than the battleship and in reality that isn't the case um quite often they're built on the same hulls um but um a battle cruiser is designed for speed and basically aggression a battleship is built to be a floating fortress so um there was a uh, there was a definition of a battle cruiser which was that um, a battle cruiser should be able to win a battle against anything smaller than it and run away from anything bigger than it which is um which is essentially like where it came from um a battleship is just like you know you plant it in an area and you deal with whatever problem you have unfortunately battle cruisers were a kind of a little bit of a failed project i, I think my research it, it doesn't really suggest any times that they've been used successfully um so right so they, they, they to look at a battleship cruiser and a battleship you to the layman you'd look at them and you will say but about the same size they look the same they've got the same size guns it's just a battleship has massive massive amounts of armor which you probably won't see because it's all on on the inside of the hull rather than on the outside a battle cruiser has big engines and it goes and in actual fact as a point as a point of fact um a battle cruiser in world war ii was one of the long or the hms hood was longer by a by quite a margin than the Yamato, which was the biggest battleship. So even to look at it at a glance, it would seem to be bigger, if, yeah. if, if, if that makes sense. Um, and, and, well, physically, it was bigger. Um, but um, so are you you're with me so far? Am I um, articulating this, this, this OK? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just thinking maybe we, maybe we could give an example um, yeah, you... uh, hang on. Uh, got some some data here. So, so the um, HMS Hood, which was uh, Royal Navy, um, that was forty five thousand tons. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, it's... Um, as 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 a battle cruiser, what and what do we want to compare it to? Um, um, uh, a, I, I, uh, uh, a, a, a a battleship or something. Like so, an Iowa battleship um which is uh for our american cousins is like kind of you know one of the one of the best examples of a battleship you know the if anyone who's watched under siege um it's a uh yeah it's a, it was the missouri um where are we so yeah and so the displacement of um of a um of the of an iowa class um so the, the the standard was forty five thousand tons. It, it went up a bit as it went as it went through various retrofits to fifty five thousand tons. 
but um but as you can see that they're, they're, they're kind of roughly the same size and again a lot of the confusion in um in, in um, a lot of um uh, sort of um military science fiction is that they're somehow smaller um, and they're not necessarily say so the the holes the holes that are produced by the various subcontractors are probably the same um it's just what goes inside the holes like for a battle cruiser you'll find that there's like you know extra power generation in terms of the engines you know extra boilers and in, in those cases in terms of a battleship you'll find that there's just big thick slabs of armor that uh, that go in in there um yeah. so that that was probably the evolution of the iowa and without diving into it in much more detail so it was probably as more armor was added to it throughout throughout its various iterations from world war ii to the and they served until the 80s um you know they're probably just more more yeah more more slabs of armor uh, attached to it and uh, various other pieces of equipment which brought it up to date uh, and then it was more cost effective not to remove the older stuff than than um than uh, uh, than to remove it yeah um, but again like like the cruiser the battle cruiser is probably like a very interesting would would have been a very interesting um ship to command because they were often dealt dealt with or, or sent on their own or in smaller groups and they did things like commerce raiding um they, they were sent to scout for a main for the main battle lines um because they had the ability to or in theory they had the ability to um to go find trouble and either beat that trouble or have the speed to get away from that trouble and then go call in the the the, uh, the battleships which would then be able to to win it um now my research says that there's not really very many examples of that successfully happening in real history yeah. um so for example probably the the, the most kind of embarrassing for the UK in terms of the use of battle cruisers is um is the battle of Jutland where for whatever reason uh, the admiralty decided to use battle cruisers in the line of battle so alongside battleships and they didn't have the armor to survive there so we lost three of them um when we really probably didn't have to um probably because the admiral said that's that looks apart we'll, we'll put it put it into the battle line that'll but that'll be all right uh, yeah it'll do the job well actually it didn't have the armor to survive in that case and it wasn't um uh that wasn't its original role um and then you look at the um, battle of the denmark strait which is the battle of um battle against the bismarck so the um bismarck was sent it is a battleship so as we've discussed something that's um you know quite solid quite a bit slower but has massive thick chunks of armor yeah it's one of the largest ships as well i mean the the, the, the three largest were the bismarck at fifty thousand tons the iowa at 53 and the yamato which was the um which was japanese battleship that was seventy three thousand tons yeah. and those, yeah. those seem to have been the largest ships of world war ii yeah the um, was absolutely well the the, the murashi was uh, the Yamato sister ship it was a little bit bigger by 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 a fraction, but um, but yeah, the, the the Yamato class was were absolute monsters, and I'll touch on them uh, in, in, in in a moment. But um, but yeah, the Germans sent the Bismarck to go commerce raid, but it was a battleship, so it was a little bit slower, um, massive chunks of armor, and uh, it was sent to go find. Atlantic convoys, so American and British convoys, and sink them. We, in our wisdom, decided to send um, HMS Hood, which is a battle cruiser, to go find it and destroy it. As it happens, the Hood was with another um, another ship, the Prince of Wales, um, and they they, they they were sent to to hunt down the uh, the Bismarck. It didn't end well. Um, Bismarck. It turned around and it basically sank um, the hood in uh, in um, in three volleys of its big big guns. Uh, so that was uh, so what was that? Twenty four rounds, twenty four rounds. So it had eight guns, eight big guns, and it sunk it in like about twenty four rounds uh, of ammunition, which is you know absolutely decimated the hood um, because the hood didn't have the armor to fight a battleship. It, you know, it, 
in theory, when we go back to the original definition, it should have spotted the uh, spotted the bid mark. So that's where the bid mark is. We can't fight it. We're backing off. Um, there were some tactical considerations. The um, the admiral in charge of the HUD thought they had a chance if they got to a certain range. But we're talking about specifics of uh, specifics of conflict and how the the armor goes. So that uh, if we could get into a certain arm, uh, get into a certain engagement range then we, we'd probably stand a chance. They didn't get there uh, and the, the HUD was sank. The Prince of Wales was massively damaged in the um, in the engagement and had to back off. Um, and then that prompted the hunt for um, the Bismarck, which ultimately resulted in its destruction. Um, but we had to send, um, well, I think there was six battleships against it, of which two engaged it in the final, final conflict along with um, uh, several cruisers and uh, several destroyers. So uh, you, you know these things. Even when the a battleship, even when it's facing against another battleship, is nothing to be. The the, the battle might be you, you, you know, quite protracted. Um, to put that in perspective, as I said, so Bismarck managed to sink Hood in around about 24 rounds or so. Of, of, of gunfire of its big, I think there were 16 inch cannons, so quite heavy cannons. Um, when we engaged Bismarck as a battleship, over 2,600 rounds of ammunition were fired against it, of big gun ammunition. Uh, so you 16 inches and uh, uh, and then your secondary batteries, which were you, you kind of eight and 12, eight to 12 inches. Um, so 2,600 rounds were fired at it. 400 rounds of ammunition uh, of shells hit the Bismarck, and yeah. there is still the debate about whether we managed to destroy the Bismarck or she was scuttled. So that shows the difference in the armor between a battle cruiser and a battleship. 24 rounds to 400 rounds is kind of like the, 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 the you know the 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 armor difference. Um, so, but they fulfill different roles. An argument would be, let, let, let's pretend, for example, that Bismarck was a battle cruiser, so faster um, and lower, may, maybe lower armoured, but with still the same guns. And she uh, she was, sorry, he, because German, warship, German capital ships were defined as masculine, and he was sent as uh, to go destroy convoys. But he had the speed to escape our battleships or evade our battleships while he was engaging them. Then actually, the Bismarck might have been more successful because yeah. it could have got, got away from any of the, the main battles. Hmm. But um, and had Hood been a battle cruise battleship as opposed to battle cruiser, then she would have she would have been. Um, far more effective in taking down the Bismarck. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just um, have, having a quick look at stuff. And it was it was a couple of days after Bismarck sank Hood that um, bombers from HMS Ark Royal um, uh, managed to uh, damage its steering gear. Yeah. And then, so then it was only it was only three days after the after the sinking of the Hood that that the that two british battleships and two heavy cruisers um uh you know sufficiently to that damage the, the the bismarck that it was well apparently according to this article scuttled by her crew mm. um well you know um uh, but um done a, done a couple of retails like some some people say she was scuttled he was scuttled others say that he was um uh, scuttled yeah. for those who don't know the term means self-destructed basically um yeah. others say that, that i mean either way you, you know that the, yeah the, i mean it was it, it was a huge it was, it was tough ship. Down, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah the the um yeah. and it's the only battleship on battleship torpedo action that happened because um one of the battleships uh that was engaged i forget which one um had pretty much run dry on ammunition and the only things they had left were torpedoes which weren't really designed for for that kind of engagement, and they were like, "It's all we got left to fire at the damn thing." Yeah, yeah. But that shows how massively powerful a battleship is. Um, and if we go on to the Yamato, which was the biggest 
battleship in the world. Uh, sorry, other than the Mirage. Biggest, biggest ship in World War Two, by, by, yeah. by what I'm looking at. So, um, yeah, yes, absolutely. By, sorry, the, Mirage, the, the Yamato class, of which the flagship of the Japanese fleet was the Yamato, but the um, uh, yeah, the biggest one was the Marashi, um, which was sunk in the Battle of Leyte Gulf, I believe. Um, yeah. So the, the anyway, the Yamato was still like kind of you, you know, it was only a fraction smaller than the Marashi. Um, but that one, um, they sent the, the our, our American allies sent over three hundred warplanes to take it down. And yeah, you know, this thing was still fighting. You know, these these things could take an immense amount of abuse, uh, and and still still keep still keep throwing out the lead. Uh, and there were you know sadly the, there were a lot of losses to to, to engage engage her. But she um, you know she was still fighting, and that 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 shows how impen impen not impenetrable because clearly they were penetrated, but how. Um, how tough these things were they, they, they were absolute monsters um and uh yeah. Yeah, that's something to be said okay if you, want to, if, you, if you want a sense of scale on on the yamato um uh it had 2700 crew um to almost 2500 of them um were were lost when it was when it was sunk um so these the, these were huge huge ships um for the time they're not quite as big as some of the uh, aircraft carriers now, but um, but yeah, they and they, they were incredibly tough, and the battle cruisers were were a little bit older. Um, yeah, and, effectively um, they were defunct by the Battle of Jutland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, then the cruisers left were kind of like legacy ships that were sort of left left over, and then they they, they weren't worth decommissioning because they thought they could still have some use. Um, so for example, yeah. the, the Americans yeah. didn't have any battle cruisers because they were like, yeah, the we, we can't find we can't think of a place for these either we'll send a cruiser or we'll send a battleship uh we 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 still had some battle cruisers that could like like get a middle ground there but they, they weren't really used successfully yeah uh, yeah they, they, they didn't have a role you know they were going against battleships and they lost uh, or they were going against cruisers and they weren't yeah. they, they were tactical victories but they weren't necessarily strategic victories yeah and there was i mean some of the british fleet was and and, and other fleets was there were still ships that had served in world war one yeah um, and um and of course once world war ii uh started the you know huge amounts of aircraft and ships were were were, were built um vastly more than than um a, a, a probably run at any other time um so um, yeah but I, th I think one of the things about world war ii is is, is there's a there's a huge variety of ships, partly because it's a global conflict. So they had lots and lots of different ships. They experimented a lot with with weapons, and they did it extremely quickly. Um, yeah, with, 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 with everything from small arms to ships. So they would they would build new ships, and they were trying to fulfil, you know, huge numbers of different different types of roles, um, and um, and and do so quickly. Um, um, just just one thing I want to touch on um, before we um, uh, wrap it up is um, the term dreadnought. Yeah. Now, um, traditionally, or oh, sorry, not traditionally, within military science fiction, a dreadnought is considered something higher than a battleship. It's considered a, um, you know, it's like it goes destroyer, cruiser, battle cruiser, battleship, dreadnought, super dreadnought. Yeah. And yeah, this may have some some kind of um, basis, but the historical use of the word dreadnought is a little bit different than what what perhaps has been portrayed in um, in various things. Um, firstly, I'll say like like probably one of the seminal works in in military science fiction is David Weaver. Firstly, just bow down to whatever he does because he's awesome. But um, uh, but yeah, he he uh, he deliberately uses the term dreadnought differently to 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 sort of the traditional use of the word dreadnought. Now, as we said, dreadnought is um, in, in in often in fiction is considered like the next scale up from 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 battleship. 
in reality that is not the case um now hms dreadnought in 1906 um was the first big all gun battleship um she was the um um the most powerful battleship that was that was um uh, that, was, that was in service at that time. She immediately rendered anything before um, nine, uh, before the dreadnought, before 1906, um, obsolete because she was such a seed shift in um, in in what 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 a battleship was. So um, that meant that within the battleship class there became three subclasses of which you had dreadnought which was this is a benchmark of what a modern battleship is um, and then obviously her her coming into service meant that there were every other nation immediately up the game and started producing um battleships as uh, dreadnought class dreadnought size and ability battleships as well anything that came up any battleship which was a battleship before dreadnought came to service became pre-dreadnought yeah so they, they were kind of they still had their uses don't get me wrong but they weren't you know they, they, they were obsolete you know if you had a pre-dreadnought versus a dreadnought you would like yeah yeah i know where my money lies here um and then you get the term super dreadnought which is that anything that was bigger than HMS Dreadnought and her peers by this point, because but you know, within a very short period of time, as you said, John, um, there's a very short period of time when um, uh, well, development cycles were a lot shorter then. So it's like, ship the the Brits have got this massive battleship. We need to up our game, and we we'll, we will produce like a Dreadnought class battleship. Yeah. And um, so anything that was substantially bigger than a dreadnought was considered a super dreadnought. So they, all three of those classes were still battleships. They were, they were just a benchmark within what is a battleship. Do, does, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and what, if we go by tonnage, dreadnought itself was 20,730 tons. Um, so, so sort of half the size of the big battleships that we've been talking about in, in World War Two. Yeah. Um, but but still obviously enormous, heavily armoured and um, and festooned with massive guns for for, for, for the time. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I I, I I I think when we when we flip over to the military sci-fi um, thing, we we we've got to you know what what why why is dreadnought used? Why is the dreadnought class used? I can I can tell you my answer. What 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 would your immediate short answer be? Why do people continually use dreadnoughts in their in their military? Because it's an obvious sort of like size differentiation between no <laughs> no it's not that size. It's because it's the coolest sounding ship class. It's one of you know it sounds brilliant, doesn't it? Dreadnought. It's uh, it's tough. It's manly. Mm. It you know I, I I think that's I think that's why. And so. It, but but yeah you're you you're right in in reality you sh you probably shouldn't peg it as you know if you're if if you're throwing a navy forward from now it would make a lot of sense to look at ship classes from world war ii and and current and see what's you know what sort of names are are the navies in the, in the future going to use for their for their spaceships they're not going to they're not going to call them uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think of something that's. Um, I'm trying to think of something that's completely out of date that would would never be used. Um, that, but they're, they're going to stick with some sort of hierarchy of, mm. of boat sizes and roles, aren't they? I mean. Yeah. So, so like, uh, I, I kind of as as sort of like a quick kind of um, uh, sort of under under over whatever you want to call it from the beginning of uh of kind of this conversation i just so sort of like to sum it up basically um to use our sort of like street fighter 2 example 
<laughs> just because it's yeah. just because it's fun. Um, all right, okay. If you had a destroyer, uh, you would a destroyer would be high speed, low armor, yeah, low weapons, yeah. A cruiser would be medium speed, medium weapons, medium armor. A battle cruiser would be um, a battle cruiser would be uh, probably um, medium speed, high weapons, medium armor. Yeah. Battleship would be low speed, high armor, high weapons. Yeah. If, if you're kind of like grading it really kind of bluntly. Um, and then within, you know, some of those subclasses, you could go like, OK, so like, all right, well, because I because I'm uh, I, I'm a diligent sci fi author and I've, I've like run, kind of really drilled down into it within the battleship. You know, we've got pre pre USS Dreadnought, post USS Dreadnought and USS Dreadnought and then USS. You know, <laughs> no, no, I, I was kind of like doing it as a start. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said stuff. Yeah, go on. John, please. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, so um, yeah, so basic, basically that that's that's kind of the table you'd you'd work to, right? So okay, coming back round, okay, you've got a hero ship. Um, so like for example, in yours, John, in in your Royal Marine Royal Marines um, saga, you've got uh, like a hero ship which is a gunboat because that's what you need to fulfil your role. Okay, uh, so yeah, because we were, in, in 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 that case, just just to be specific, we 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 wanted a tiny ship that absolutely should not be engaging other ships, just to make it hard for the yeah. for the characters. So yeah. so it's, I think you'll find in Miller's, you know, you, you, you're often going to have a ship that probably shouldn't be trying to do the things that it's being asked to do. You know, it's too old. It's it's the wrong type of ship. It's it's on its own and it shouldn't be. You know. You'll, you'll, you'll find that as a common trope because um because you can't put them in a brand spanking new perfect ship <laughs> immediately it's become exciting hasn't it because your your hero ship is going against sort of nothing yeah uh, against something bigger so um so right okay like, like on a table because kind of pick 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 what you need is, is your is your hero ship needed to be the biggest baddest kind of ship that's out there in which case battleship all the way you've got high armor high 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 weapons maybe it's a little bit slower um is your ship you know yeah it's fast it's maneuverable it's um um it's got but you know it can't really like toe the line against sort of like a big you know zargoth battleship there uh and it doesn't have the guns it's got to be more cunning than destroyer um yeah. have you, have you got sort of like kind of an enterprise kind of situation where you've got it's like someone going out into the into the void into the unknown with kind of um you know, and, and it's got to have the ability to deal with most things, and you kind of got a cruiser level there. Um, so, you know, they do lend themselves to, to 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 whatever story you want as well, which is, I think, where 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 uh, and it's something we can we can go on to in in, in greater depth. But um, ultimately, we, you know, that's where we're at. So, uh, look at um, what what do you need. From your from your hero ship, and bear in mind that your hero ship probably has plus armor as well, which is yes, which is yeah. absolutely indestructible unless yeah. you want it to be destructible. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you got to you got to get your level of plausibility. What we couldn't so so with with our with our series, as we we move from focusing on marines to focusing on the navy, um, and. We we have them have to use this gunboat ship in in the first big navy um, book because the because the bigger ship is too heavily battle damaged so so they've got to rely on the on the small ship um, to an extent um, and it's designed to so so gunboats are for bombarding fixed positions so you use it to bombard a port that you're attacking it's not there to 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 destroy the Bismarck. So it's a small ship, and it's with with some thumping great guns on it, and it and it and it's got this specific. Yeah, the gunboats had mortars on them, didn't yeah. they? Rather than cannons, so they weren't yeah. even designed to engage other warships. They were no, exactly. They yeah, water. Yeah. You would sail. So our, our our space version is for for using a mass impact driver 
um, which you should know about from, from basically we're talking a massive rail gun, but you'll you'll have seen them in seen them you'll have read read about them in the moon is a harsh mistress by Robert Heinlein, where it's a static one on the moon. But basically you launch a massive lump of whatever, probably just rock that you found in space. Um, you you launch it at speed and when it hits whatever it hits, it's going to hit with the force of a of a uh, of like a nuclear weapon or, or similar you know it's it, the, the kinetic impact is going to be enormous so that's all this ship does so they have to use it sneakily in order to achieve any results but then in the in the later books because the the, the, the navy is having to resurrect old boats we have gone with a dreadnought and the reason we've gone with a dreadnought is because we want it to sound old and tough and out of date because it is old and tough and out of date and it's from a it's from a pre previous generation of their of their shipping and of course the royal navy have reused the name dreadnought because if you look up if you look up enterprise for instance um probably lots of us think oh enterprise that's you know that's captain kirk but actually that name has been used for, for centuries um and it will continue to get get reused in in the future just a little bit ago so i'd say the um in, uh, our u.s cousins have um the latest destroyer, which there is no argument that um, it, it can be classed as a cruiser, but ultimately they've, they've, they've said it's a destroyer and, and therefore we'll, we'll, we'll stick with that, is what's called the Zumwalt class, yeah. um, which is um, kind of a stealthy, big, um, it's, it's got a small gun, but it's designed for firing missiles in a stealthy way. Um, but the first captain of the USS Zumwalt was called James Kirk. <laughs> oh, he must have got some stick for that. Oh. That 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 is uh, that is awesome. Yeah, yeah, and and actually, you'll see the British destroyers, the the, the Type Forty Fives, the new ones look similar, and they um, they're well worth looking up if you haven't seen these these new ships because they have sort of very clean, sharp lines. They look like like stealth aircraft, but I think um, the thing that's one one thing. So we we've kind of focused on World War Two here. And, yeah. Um, uh, we, 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 we definitely overrun it again, John, because that, that's how we roll. Uh, but um, you, we, we've, we, we've kind of pigeonholed World War Two is kind of like where we're going to kind of like do it because that's that's sort of like the um, kind of where most people when they write military science fiction, it tends to be to a certain degree or other World War Two in space, fighter pilots, big big ships dog fighting but still um you know capital ship engagements of, of yeah. some degree um best examples i can think of offhand um wing commander an old computer game mm -hmm. conflict free space they were brilliant examples of that kind of that kind of use where, where they got it about right um in terms of that use honor harrington series uh, he gets it right you know caveat with the discussion about dreadnoughts but i think he's kind of built that into his narrative as well uh, so um and he's david waver he's right I'll, I'll i'll say that uh, just just straight away um star wars probably not the place to go for two for kind of factually correct stuff but that is an example of how you can completely ignore the whole of our conversation and just go your own way <laughs> that's uh, uh, and just make, make it up on the fly yeah um and and do so successfully um uh, so what, what what are other examples so we, we, we spoke briefly on the free show about you can like go back to the age of sale we're not going to go do it in any depth whatsoever but um if you go into the age of sale um then um you know again the, all of these terms have the, 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 they they are the same but have different terms if that makes sense so for example your destroyers will probably be called sloops uh, your uh, um, your cruisers um, will probably be called frigates which are also still currently used but relatively interchangeably with destroyers but so you'll go sloops destroyers and then your your big your big battleships will be called man of wars um which uh, so man of war was a portuguese um a portuguese tri deck um ship of the line um i do want to touch on the line briefly sorry john i know we're trying to get away but no, no that's okay 
Um, uh, so they they were um, they they were sort of like tried extra for the lines, you know, lots, you know, hundred guns or so, uh, and that that was kind of the benchmark. Roughly, the, that was the, a man of war was the dreadnought of of its era. Yeah. Anyway, so just just to box off the discussion, I, I've mentioned several times, and I said I was going to explain it later, so I'll just explain it now. The line of war. Um, so, right. In a battle, um, there's, there's a battle line. Um, so the reason why battleships are called battleships is because they are designed to win battles. Um, nothing else was really designed to win battles in that kind of historical era. It's like, OK, we, we've got an engagement to be had. Right, we want to scout something. We'll send a destroyer. We want a diplomatic mission, and we want to defeat some like kind of like small scale like course we'll send a cruiser um right we're involved in a war and we need to commerce raid against like enemy shipping etc we'll send a battle cruiser when it comes to a when it comes to a battle against a comparable enemy you you'll create a battle line uh, and that has formed a battleships um so one of the reasons why so if you were talking back to the original the, the start of our discussion um i said like there were two kind of ship classes which yeah, if I personally was a captain, it would be the ones I want to captain. That's cruiser and battle cruiser because it strikes me they're a bit more interesting to command. You're more kind of like sent out on your own and you're told to deal with a situation. For battleships, it's probably a little bit more of a boring command, even though it's a more prestigious ship, possibly. Um, it is because you, you're kind of tightly locked into a battle line. It's like you're not really sent to operate on your own. If you're sending out a battleship, you're sending out a battleship with a purpose uh, because, you know, the big, the heavy, the designed to win wars. Um, so you'll send them out in squadrons, divisions, fleets, like the Battle of Jutland, and you will, you know, they will engage against something that, that is roughly comparable and they will they'll sit next to each other and they'll fire broadsides or, or I know not broadside, but bear with bear with us on naval <laughs> you, yeah that, yeah they, 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 they're, they're going to tough it out with direct fire and yeah. yeah 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 absolutely and there might be some tactical interplay but ultimately you you, you know they're not subtle pieces of equipment they're, they're there to have a big battle um and they will traditionally form part of a battle line um or a line well, the, of the, the you know the, the the wooden ships the tall ships they had to they had to use the, the wind power that was driving them and and, and maneuver a lot in a, in a way that with the petrol ships you know all those ships can move <laughs> and they can move at the speed that they can move so it's a very different dance to what was done during um uh oh god what was what was nelson's one trafalgar trafalgar was very different to anything and you know anything 150 years later so yeah, um, and, and again, that that's, that's that's probably another discussion. I mean, it'd be great to say that, um, you know, explore how um, the you know environmental factors can offset these things because yeah, you've got sort of like various engagements through history where, um, for example, we've got one way where a destroyer has engaged a a cruiser and won. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, despite despite the, the the massive disparity in ability. Uh, one of the one of the most interesting anecdotes um, I've heard, and it's a slight aside, is um, the phrase "Q ship," uh, which uh, have you ever heard "Q ship"? No. A Q ship is a freight uh, is a is a warship that's designed to look like a like an enemy um, non-combatant. So, for example, right. a freighter or something like that. And uh, there, there's. Um, I I, I, I I want to do some more research into this as a show because uh, I'm quite willing to um, stand stand and be corrected on the on the comments. But in World War One, there was a quite an interesting <laughs> engagement which involved a British Q ship versus a German Q ship. So these are cruisers that are designed to look like freighters. Yeah. So I you know they drop their um, the, the 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 storage storage bays and they've got massive guns there but what they'll do is they'll identify a specific enemy warship they want it to look like 
uh, sorry, an enemy freight, uh, enemy freighter they would want it to look like. So you had a British freighter, which I think was called the MS Americas, which was then adapted to look like a German, sorry, a British warship, the Americas, designed to look like a German freighter. But meanwhile, the Germans independently have said, okay, we've got a, a, our warship, we want it to make, make it look like a freighter on the British side that's equivalent. And then you have two freighters, which were essentially thought they were the same, like preying on each other. <laughs> but actually, both of them were Q ships. Nice. And, and it resulted in one of the most interesting yields. And, and in fact, I'll, I'll have another second. I'm going to do a little bit more research into it because, I, as I recall from the little bit I read, it was an absolutely fascinating story, which is let's set aside the fact that people died and it was a little bit well, amusing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah, one, one, one of my favourite stories is when you when you look into how Drake defeated the Spanish Armada and, um, and one of his things was he, he went and found where they were and sent a fire ship into port with them um, and burnt a bunch of them. <laughs> um, no, no straight up battle there. He, he started it by, by making sure he burnt as many of their ships um, as, as he could. They literally took an old ship, pushed it towards the, the port, set it on fire and it set fire to the other ships in in, in and around the port. Um, and, and that is, um, you know. Uh, you know, and, and, and you know, if we, if we go back to the hero ship thing, you know, ultimately that, that that's a really good plot, isn't it? So, yeah, scutt scuttle a ship, you know, you you know, we, 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 we've done that in one of ours, we've, we've scuttled one of their ships. Um, uh, because it's a it's a great it's a great cool thing to do. You'll see Kirk, Captain Kirk does it all the time. He's forever trashing the Enterprise to to save the day. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> um, oh. and of course, his isn't actually a warship either, which is which is an important thing. He's it yeah, it's got its military capability, but it's not really a warship. So he he's they, they're generally having to cheat in order to win any of the conflicts that they're that they're engaged in. Um, so. Uh, and you, you, you know, I, I think when you when you're writing when you're writing um, when, when, when you're writing military sci-fi, you probably want to be talking about about your heroes having to be cunning and um, and maybe a bit underhanded. They you could have them just go, oh yeah, I've got this big ship and I'm just going to pound at the other guy until I win, like Rocky. But that's probably not what's going to going to interest people. You you probably want to. Yeah have to exceed your ability in order and, and and defeat a foe that you really shouldn't be able to defeat through clever tactics and and stuff not not you know not overwhelming power that you have or some some flangy yeah. weapon that you do so so to to use sort of like we're really so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll box this off so to use yeah. some like kind of good military science fiction or science fiction examples of like the various classes so destroyer um the uss defiant in um in in star trek i think that's a really good example of a destroyer it's something small fast maneuverable um designed to you know it fires big guns it can't take a lot of damage it's got a low crew don't get me wrong you wouldn't send it into the arse end of nowhere because it doesn't have the endurance but it's um it's um it's for know. defending the fleet against yeah. A, a, yeah. A, against small ships that have powerful attacks so it's a, it's not for defeating the battleships directly it's for protecting the fleet from the from torpedo boats and and, and stuff like that um, um cruiser what, what would be a good cruiser in um, in military science fiction um or, or or a tv show um i hesitate to use the example from star trek twice but um yeah, the, the the original Enterprise, the as in the original series one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mid size. I get the impression that the, the Federation had a lot bigger ships out there. Um, it yeah. was like a lot smaller ones. It was just a medium one. Okay, we're going to send you out on a five year mission. Yeah, it's not going to degradate our our um, the defense of the Federation in any way to send you, um, but also you're big enough to handle whatever you you find out there. Um, battle cruiser, something fast. Um, something powerful, something hard hitting. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe that ship on the expanse, the rocket antenna. Oh, yeah, that's actually quite tiny when you think about it. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably call that maybe, kind of like a Corvette or something. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, um, I come, the problem is, is well, there's a very good reason why battle cruisers are defunct is because they you know you either send something big or you send something medium um you yeah. know something half medium um battleship again we'll come back to the expanse the donninger um yeah you've got this yeah. massive thing that can you know it hold held its own against sort of like what was that half a dozen like enemy yeah like kind of stealth um, ships that it had no no kind of heads up or warning against and it's still yeah. a kick ass um, i'd say a carrier equivalent i'd probably pick um uh, the galactica yes um battleship carrier equivalent uh, hybrids uh, which is a good term Prob if we'd had more time it would have been good to, to touch on it because uh, but it hasn't been done in reality but yeah it's, you know battle battle star galactica is a great kind of example of um you know something that can hold its own in kind of a battle line yeah that has the ability to launch fighters um, yeah and, and a lot of star wars ones do as well the, the star destroyers launch huge numbers of fighters um because fighters look cool yeah but then they're expected to uh, ask uh, to uh, engage uh, by the way for anyone like google homework for anyone watching this it's the um uh, the, the battle I was talking about with the Q ship, Q ships that were disguised, disguised to look like each other um, and ended up looking the same and engaging each other in battle was um, the Carmania versus the Cap Trafalgar. And uh, yeah, it, it's sort of like one of those almost comedic situations where like the, like our, our ship ended up fighting the Sherman ship. Hold on, that's our ship? That's got to be a Q ship. And then the... Uh, the, the, the um, uh, yeah, the same conversation was being had on the German side, and the, the, the two ended up having a major battle. It's amusing. Let's set aside the fact that a lot of people died in that because it's, it is actually one of the most thrilling battles of World War One as well. But um, anyway, yeah. right. Um, I think I'm going to call it now, John. If that's yeah. all right. Yeah, that's, that's that's great. I think that's that's more than enough for, for people to be thinking about. I mean, I, I I think as as with a lot of the conversations we've been we've been doing so far on KSI, um, a, a lot of the reason to think about this stuff is to take take information from the real world, from our history, and from from the current period, and 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 project that forward so that when when the readers read your 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 science fiction, uh, you you, do, you don't want them thrown out of the story because they think, well, I don't know, sh shouldn't this be a battleship or an aircraft carrier equivalent? It, you know, it doesn't it doesn't sound right because if you if you say it's a little corvette and you go and it's the biggest ship in the universe and it's a corvette, no no navy is ever going to call one of their you know their biggest current ship a corvette because it's just not right. You know, you know. Um, so. Right. It, 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 it's not going to destroy your story, but it's worth it's worth considering these things. Um, it might add a little bit, is what we're saying. Okay, okay. John, it's, a, it's a closing time, which is your your your. Yeah. So um, uh, I should I really need to write down like a closing speech, don't I? But thanks very much for listening, listening folks. We we hope you found the information useful and that you'll uh, like and subscribe to the to the channel and listen to all the other amazing content. If you look at the um Peter Medium youtube channel you'll find that the amount of videos that we're putting out now has has massively increased um and we've we've got all sorts of things going on josh is doing uh video blogs several times a week now um uh, scott is putting out more material and we've got great stuff coming out with the writer's journey um as well as the uh, as the existing live shows on on monday night um, so uh, please do um, like and subscribe to, video, to the videos and comment to us on YouTube and we'll, we'll try and respond um, and, and share them with friends. So thanks very much for stopping by. So it's good night from Ralph and it's good night from me. Good night. Good night.